you to give her your undivided attention and also to pray for her, that the Holy Spirit will guide her as she speaks. Amen. Today we have set aside this Sabbath for religious liberty. And we know that every year our church um, celebrates religious liberty. Freedom. Can we be free here? And freedom beyond when Jesus comes to take us to our home. Shall we bow? Loving Heavenly Father, this morning I ask that you will take me and hide me behind the cross. I pray that you would guide my thoughts and my lips this morning as I bring a message to your people. May you, God, sanctify me. And Lord, may we at the end of this day be willing to recommit our lives to you and to hold up the banner of religious liberty, cost it what it will. We would be willing to put on the whole armor of God and to stand firm today. In Jesus' name, amen. One rich image about our church is that it is the body of Christ. The church is not a mere non-governmental organization. Whatever our church is involved in, it is based on a spiritual worldview that is biblically based it is Christ-centered and Holy Spirit-driven to the glory of God and for the good of creation. The church's engagement with any aspect of reality, whatever it be, whether social, political, whether it be legal, whether it be economical, judicial, or any other sphere. It should be clearly informed by a biblical worldview. Hundreds of organizations, NGOs in particular, they put forth significant effort and resources working selflessly and with great sacrifices to promote, to protect, and to define, defend the freedom of religion or our beliefs. We looked at Revelation 12, 11, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their selves unto death. People of all philosophies or religious persuasions affirm human dignity based on various premises. Christians humbly believe that there is more that needs to be brought to the public square, so to speak. We embrace human dignity as a foundation of religious liberty. 
people from various religion and theological backgrounds and persuasions share the belief that the foundation of human rights resides in the dignity of every human person. But more specifically, from a Judo-Christian perspective, this dignity is based on the fact that humans are created in the image of God according to his likeness. Moreover, since the Bible states that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, according to Colossians 1.15, Christians take the issue of human dignity further. Our spiritual commitment with Jesus makes human dignity inseparable from considering God's sovereignty in our lives. Therefore, our respect for people reflects our respect for God. Christians participate in the world of Christ, in the whole universe. He alone, that is Christ Jesus alone, is worthy according to Revelation 5.4. No one is found in heaven, on earth, or under the earth worthy to open the book of destiny of the humankind, but Christ Jesus himself. The angle from which Christians view the whole of reality is the grace and the privilege to participate in the dignity of God as revealed in Christ Jesus. Christians have adopted the premise that this dignity is grounded on the creation of every person in God's image according to his likeness. This perspective implies respecting every human person and by implications, his or her civil, socio, political, cultural, and human rights. Today, more than respect, ideally, if Christians live up to their calling, respecting every person they meet would be a minimum. God gives a clear commandment to love our neighbors as ourselves. If Christians were to take this word of God seriously, the message of Christ would be more credible and the world would be different. Talking even about freedom without building one's relations with everyone upon this foundation creates a lack of harmony. All the biblical laws and the entire Torah itself depends on the commandment to love and to love one another and to love our neighbors as oneself, says Jesus in Matthew chapter 23 and verse 37. However, God explicitly expanded in many ways these two fundamental commandments for the purpose of helping us to be creative in affirming human dignity. He asked us, for example, to honor every person. According to 1 Peter 2.6, the Bible says, Act as a free man and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. Honor all people. Love the brotherhood. Fear God and honor the king. 
servants according to the scriptures. Be submissive to your master with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. For this finds favor. For it is the sake of conscience towards God, a person bears up under sorrow when suffering you unjustly. For what credit is there if when you sin, when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God, according to 1 Peter 2.17. What is a whole way of thinking of religious liberty? The central place of religious liberty has been widely recognized. It is said that religious freedom is the prerequisite for and the guidance of all other freedoms. More fundamentally, however, a whole new paradigm of thinking about human rights, about freedom of religions or belief, and human dignity is needed. Paradoxically, it is the paradigm that has been initiated by God and that man who came down from heaven to promote on earth the kingdom of, of God. So Christ himself initiated that freedom. More than a culture of human rights, but including it, we are called to promote a deeper culture of commitment to uphold, to promote, to honor human dignity in all our dealings. This is not just about human performance in the public square, about programs, but in the place to get recognitions or accolades or adoption in Christ should give us the peace and the confidence in every person's infinite value. We who find the solution of all human predicament in Christ and his coming are called to guard ourselves, esteeming the value of a person through performance, connection, prestige, or being recognized or rewarded and the like. The value of human being is deeper than all of these. Concerning Christ's attitude to the prompt of society, Jesus knew the worthlessness of earthly prompt, and he gave no attention to this display. In his dignity of soul, his evaluation of character, his nobility of principle, he was far above vain fashion of the world. Although the prophet described him as despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief, he might have been esteemed as the highest among the noble of earth. The best circle of human society would have courted him. He had condescended to accept their favor. But he desired not to applause men, but moved independently of all human influence. Wealth, position, worldly rank, in all its varieties and distinctions of human greatness, was all but so many degrees of littleness to him who had left the honor and glory 
of heaven and who possessed no earthly splendor, indulged in no luxury, and displayed no adornment but humility. There are scriptures that clearly portray Christ as our example when it comes to that moral. For you have been called for this purpose. Since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his step, who committed no sin, nor was on any defect found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself and to live the righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed, and for you continually straying like sheep. But now you have returned to your shepherd and guardian of your soul, according to 1 Peter 2.21. Human dignity then elevates every person we meet to the status of one with infinite worth, a person to be respected, loved, and honored. This morning, as we look at justice beyond God's righteousness, another key foundation in the human rights and freedom of religion or belief is that inseparable from the idea of justice. But here too, we, while adhering, while supporting and promoting justice for all, for the sake of Jesus Christ and his teaching, let us take this issue further. Jesus Christ spoke about righteousness that must surpass that of the scribes and the Pharisees of that day. What the law required was actually a minimum from the point of view of Jesus Christ. The follower of Jesus, therefore, goes far beyond than what the law requires. Christians are law-abiding citizens. In so far as law do not violate their conscience, they do not neglect the law of the land. They surpass them indeed. They transcend the requirements of the law. They respect legislations precisely by going beyond what they demand they become societal signs of God's righteousness. The law demands justice, even retributive justice. And Jesus emphasized distributive justice, also called righteousness. Jesus came to go beyond the retributive or even the restorative justice or reparative justice to promote distributive justice that climaxes in love, even love for an enemy. The attention is no longer on oneself and on one's need and right, but rather on the others, the neighbors, and their needs, and what we owe them. The righteousness of Jesus promotes, is illustrated in the famous so-called antithesis that says, you have heard that it is, was said, you shall not murder. But I tell you, do not be angry against your brother. Do not insult your brother. In other words, do not put people in boxes, for in doing so you confine them, which is 
contrary to the freedom for which they were born, according to Matthew 5, 21 and 26. Freedom and beyond. The undergrounding value of these words of Jesus is freedom. One's freedom and other people's freedom by not judging and confining one's brother or enemy. The word of Jesus in the so-called antithesis climax in this unparalleled transforming statement that says, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Is that what God says? But I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sends the rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love the, those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Freedom is Christianity's most central ideal. However, for Christians, the supreme value is not freedom per se, for that would transform freedom into an idol. God is our supreme value. Loyalty to God is more important than the freedom. In the book of Revelation, the victorious Christians value loyalty to God more than their own lives. They overcame, according to our scripture reading, they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because the word of their testimony and they did not love their lives even when they feared death. God is indeed the supreme value. Conformity to God's person and purposes is the focus of all freedom lovers, even at the expense of their own rights. Even when their rights are violated, Christians still seek the welfare of others for God's sake. Freedom to love and fellowship with one's brother and sister in humility is deep in the priority list of God's character and will. The recognition, the respect, the protection, and the promotion of human dignity led to the respecting, the protecting, the promoting freedom of all freedoms and in particular, of freedom of conscience. We, as Adventists, have been historically sensitive to the need to resist restrictions to our religious freedom. Revelation chapter 13 tells us all about this. It is seen as a chapter that this depicts the attempt at imposing not only false worship, but also persecution and restriction to freedom of God's end-time people, even beyond the religious sphere. In this context, we have an enormous impact on the church's consideration of religious freedom. We believe in religious freedoms according to the principle of God's word, that it is essential for us to stand up for what we believe. The banner of truth and religious liberty held aloft by the founders of the gospel of the church and by God's witnesses 
during the centuries that have passed since then has in this last conflict been committed to our hands. The responsibility for the great gift rests with those whom God has blessed with knowledge of his word. We are to receive this word as a supreme authority. We are to recognize human government as an ordinance of divine appointment and teach the obedience to it as a sacred duty within its legislative spheres. But when it claims conflict with the claims of God, we must obey God rather than man. God's word must be recognized above all human legislation. As thus says the Lord, is not to be set aside for a thus says the church or a thus says the state. The crown of Christ is to be lifted above the diadems of earthly potentials. Hallelujah. We are entrusted to missions. We are entrusted to restore the truth. We are entrusted to promote religious freedom. The restoration aspect to restore truth makes us into a restorative movement. The emphasis being of the restoration of the whole chain of the biblical truth including what has been called present truth. The promotion of religious liberty has characterized Seventh-day Adventists since the early days of the founders. So much so that an organization for promoting the defense of religious liberty was established in 1893, I think it was. The connection between Adventists and freedom is also present in the name Seventh-day Adventist. Have you ever thought of Sabbath and freedom? Both missions, restoration of truth and promotion of religious freedom are inscribed in the name Seventh-day Adventist. Seventh-day refers not only the Sabbath of creation, which is the commemoration of God's sovereignty as the creator according to Exodus 20, but it was instituted by God as the commemoration of freedom according to to Deuteronomy 5. In particular, is freedom from slavery, freedom from oppression, and dominion of one's people group by another. Every Sabbath is considered Independence Day. When we celebrate independence, what are we celebrating? Freedom. Every Sabbath is Independence Day. A day of gratitude for deliverance, praise God. A day of fellowship and joy and peace. The Sabbath is more profoundly and in an unparalleled way and unprecedentedly in the history of religion. Thought is connected to the human dignity because of the special status of human beings in the created order. At creation, our God created human beings in his own image, according to his likeness. God created the Sabbath for rest and fellowship. From a broader perspective, 
what was said about human dignity and justice is also true for freedom. We support the freedom recognized by the international community in the context of human rights. However, there are deeper reasons than mere solidarity with the human family. The Bible provides a deeper perspective that we can only br briefly mention here this morning on Religious Liberty Sabbath. Jesus came to provide freedom in the clear in his our inaugural address, according to Luke 4, 18 and 19. In the Gospel of John, he stated that it is the Son of God himself who gives us freedom. If the Son makes us free, you will be free indeed, according to John 8, 36. Jesus' death on the cross of Calvary provides the necessary expiration to release us from the penalty of sin, from death, from Satan and the evil spirits. His resurrection inaugurates an era of true freedom. Death is defeated. Communication relationships, and life can truly spring. Freedom is inseparable from the Holy Spirit. Where the Spirit is, there is freedom, says the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 3.18. Christians have been called to freedom according to Galatians 5. 1 and 13. What is the profile of a free person? A free person is a person full of the Holy Spirit. A person who bears the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. A free person is one who reflects God's character. A free person is one who is willing to give up his or her freedom for the sake of others if necessary. Just like Jesus, just like the Apostle Paul who says, for though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all so that I may win more. I have become all things to all men so that I, by all means, may save some. I do all things for the sake of the gospel so I may become as a fellow partaker of it. 1 Corinthians 9, 19 to 22. I hope you're taking notes so you can go and check it out yourself. It's not Sister King saying. These words most likely inspire the reformer Martin Luther, who wrote, A Christian person is a free sovereign above all things, subject to no one by faith. But a Christian person is a dutiful servant in all things and subject to everyone by love. Christian courtesy in the public arena is one of the most beautiful expression of freedom. True courtesy is not learned by a mere practice of rules of etiquette. Priority of department is at all times to be observed. Whatever principle is not compromised. Consideration of others 
would lead to compliance with accepted customs. But true courtesy requires no sacrifice of principles to conventionality. Sorry. It ignores the caste. It teaches self-respect, respect for dignity of man as man, a regard for every member of the great human brotherhood. As religious freedom promoters, we are called to give heed to the following counsels. None should feel at liberty to preserve a cool and chilling reserve of iron dignity, a spirit that repels those who are brought within its influence. The spirit is contagious. It creates an atmosphere that white withers good impulses and good resolve. Under its influence, person becomes constrained. And the natural current of human sympathy, cordially and love, is choked. The gloom and the chill of this unsocial atmosphere is reflected in the continents. And not only it is spiritual health that affect, is affected by this unnatural depression, but the physical health is also affected. There are sacredly two whose experience are not alike in particular. So no two persons have the same qualities. One's trials may not be the trials of another. And our heart should ever be open to kindly sympathy and a glow with the divine love that Jesus manifested for all his brethren. In a world of controversy, in a world of conflict, a world of violence and war, freedom is at all time at risk. Freedom from a spiritual perspective to maintain one's freedom, one must wear the whole armor of God mentioned in Ephesians 6, 10 to 18. Revival and reformation should position us to restore of the restoration of truth including true freedom of our master. Our understanding of freedom is connected to the very reason God created human images in his likeness according to his manner. Freedom is a prerequisite to love. It is therefore at the root of the covenant between God and human beings and also between themselves. We have been sensitive and aware of the toxic nature of persecution as it violates human dignity. In connection to freedom, chapter 12 and 13 of the book of Revelation depicts the murderous beast that tries to restrict the freedom of God's people. Their moral of operation is persecution, intimidation, and the use of threats as a fear, as a weapon. To stand for peace, regardless of the violations of one right, in accordance with the character of God, we desire for peace, regardless the violations of one rights, in accordance with the character of God. We desire the freedom, even for those who rejected him, mistreated him, and crucified him. Are we willing to renew 
our commitment to God's mission today. Church, we have been promoters of both freedom and truth. And this tradition must continue because it does much good. However, in order to be cons consistent and relevant in our day and age, that some people call post-Christian, post-modern, and post-colonial, religious liberty must include a life dedicated to freedom, justice, righteousness, and peace, just as Jesus has shown us in his life. To embrace true freedom means to renounce a spirit of domination, to renounce a spirit of abuse or use of people, recognizing infinite worth in others for the sake of Christ. The Lord goes with the determination to honor all people, to affirm human dignity in all. It is not God's purpose that any human being should yield his mind and will to the control of another, becoming a passive instrument in his hand. No one is to merge his individuality to that of another. He is not to look to any human being as the source of healing. His dependence must be on God. In the dignity of his God-given manhood, he is to be controlled by God himself, not by any human intelligence. My admonition to you here this morning on this Religious Liberty Sabbath is, may God help us to renounce all forms of violence, all forms of persecution, all forms of violation of people, all forms of conscious and physical and emotional integrity. May the grace of God this morning give us the strength to embrace peace in all its dimensions. May he give us this morning the determination to uphold every person's dignity. May he also create in us this morning the will and the passion to work for the freedom of everyone until the one who is coming comes. Are we willing this morning to reconfirm to what God wants of us. Are we willing this morning to put on the whole armor of God? Are we willing this morning to bear the fruit of the Spirit, to further the work of the gospel as we celebrate Religious Liberty Day today? Maranatha, Jesus is coming. Let us be ready. May God bless you.
we, your people, stand before you. Oh God, we are asking you to search our hearts today and help us to be willing to stand firm on the word of God, no matter what may come our way. For we know that you are our protector. And if we should lose our life here, once we are fully grounded in you, we know that we would have that eternal freedom when you come once again. So bless us as we go. May you, O oh God, tickle our hearts today and search us and help us to be willing to stand firm no matter what. But we will stand on your principle, the word of God. So bless us to this end, we pray in Jesus' name.